Hello and welcome back. Uh, this is a series of videos with me, Rick Pelt Steel. We're talking about improving our writing by doing some little analyses uh, to uh, see whether we're on track. And in this video, we're looking at the finest level, which is to look at the sentence level of our structures and make sure our sentences are doing their job. So to remind you where we are, we uh, did an introduction uh, at the very big picture of of setting up an article and what we can achieve, setting out our purpose and how we'll achieve it. We looked at the top level of the article to see how it's uh, fitting in that purpose. Um, then we looked at the mid-level of the article at the paragraph level to see how each paragraph was fitting into the greater structure and whether each paragraph was doing its job. And now finally, we're gonna look at the sentences. And when we talk about sentences, I'm gonna share a screen with you. When we talk about sentences, the most important thing in a sentence is its main subject and its main verb, almost always. If those aren't the most important thing going on in the sentence, we want to make sure that as writers we have a reason why. Uh, but most of the time, the, the main subject and verb are the most important. And of those, I'd say the verb is the most important. It's the action. And that's what uh, we want our reader to see is action, action, action. Let's follow the progress of this article from point A to point B and see what it's all about. So we wanna see who's doing the action and what they're doing. So the subject and the verb. And of course, we'll focus on main clauses and sentences, but we also can, can give consideration to longer important subordinate clauses uh, so that we make sure they're doing their job too. I've pulled here just um, really quite out of the blue. I haven't hardly looked at this, but I pulled just uh, two pages from the middle of a chapter I, I did for a book some years back on uh, FOI and electronic uh, access to electronic records. And I just want to uh, jump in with sentence by sentence analysis so we can see what is going on, even taken almost out of context, not even knowing what this thing's really about. And what I'd urge you to do with your writing, go through and do what we're about to do. Uh, I like to underline and then circle. You can do it however you like, maybe different color highlighters. But what is the subject and verb of every sentence? That's what we want to know. And we want to then, after we do that, step back and look at them. So neutrality as a controlling principle was a deliberate central feature of the FOIA revolution. I've got neutrality was. Historic special interest rule turned on articulation of identity. Uh, historic rule turned on. In the 20th century and still today, when common law complements statute, public interest in disclosure became an element. Public interest became. The element sometimes drifted from the requesters, so I've got element drifted. The objective focus accords with statutory FOI. Objective focus accords. I've got a pretty significant subordinate clause here. I'm going to mark this one, which typically is neutral, is really being the verb. Otherwise stated FOI norms, FOI norms proclaim. Next paragraph, FOIAs came about reflecting favorably on the open records law, cross, it was instrumental, cited, cross, cited, citizen and person and so on. The evil these statutes sought to avoid, evil sought to avoid. Uh, and actually cross explained is actually the subject and verb of this sentence, but because we're using it only as an attribution, I'm gonna focus on what the sentence is about. Where the high court was seldom, is really a subordinate clause, but we'll say high court was seldom allergic, or it was. Before the federal FOIA, the proper and direct concern test, so concern test, had rationalized. Let me scroll down a little bit here. Denial of access, clearly articulated categorical exemptions in the FOIA superseded. So exemptions superseded. A House report reasoned 
and that's a, a long independent clause. So I'm going to say government employee at any level uh, believes public interest will be served. So I've got employee believes, as no employee believes. And then finally, requester neutrality and politically negotiated exemptions, neutrality, exemptions, replaced. Let's just stop there and see what we've got. If I go through and read these, neutrality was special interest rule turned on, public interest became, element drifted, objective accords, norms proclaim. So one thing I want you to see all, right off the top, only one of these right here was and, and became as a linking verb, uh, only a couple of instances of passive structures, that is, B verbs, so-called, I'm trying to write the letter B, but I can't get it, B verbs, um, passive structures. When we're using the, the verb to be, or a similar linking verb, uh, such as became, we want to make sure that the purpose there is to state an equality or a description. That should be the only reason we use that verb. And, and the verb be gets overworked. It does a lot more than that. Um, because we talk with it a lot more, but it really needs to be restricted in our writing when it's going to take away from more active and colorful verbs that tell a story. And that's what I want these subjects and verbs to be doing as I go through this text. Am I telling a story effectively? Now I do start with neutrality was. I, I could maybe make that better. Neutrality as a controlling principle was a deliberate and central feature. But if it's definitional in nature, that's what I'm allowed to use be, because I'm saying, I'm going to tell you something about neutrality. I'm going to describe it or define it. And so maybe that's an appropriate starting point. Now I've got a rule turning on, a, a public interest that becomes and then drifts, and a focus that accords. And then I've got norms that proclaim. These are good verbs. They tell a story, turning, becoming, drifting, according and proclaiming. I'm looking at a development, right? And isn't that what we want out of a paragraph? I start with neutrality, which the thesis sentence defines, and then these verbs, these subject verb choices, develop the concept through the arc of the paragraph. And they show us, they leave an impression of that development, how it turned on, then it became and drifted, but then it accords and now proclaims. Right, next paragraph, FOIA came about, it's not the strongest, not the strongest choice of words, uh, came about to ameliorate inconsistencies and potential for abuse. Well, all right, I'm setting a time frame. It's a thesis sentence. I'm going to defend my choice of verb uh, to say that I'm setting a, the frame of this paragraph as about, as this coming about, as this progression. Um, you know, it's not that you need to be hypercritical of what you write, but you want to be skeptical of what you write and look back and say, did I choose the best word? Is it the right word for the job? Can I defend it? And if you can defend it, keep it. But if it doesn't work, if it doesn't communicate what you want it, then throw it out. So cross cited, I'm not using cited here in the technical sense, but rather as a resort to explanation. And so cross cited, I think is appropriate. Evil sought to avoid. So, uh, evil sought to avoid tells me that I've got cross citing, uh, right? If I'm talking about FOIA coming about, cross is the foundation of that. The evil we are remedying and cross explains, uh, cross explains how we averted that evil, right? So it's a nice dynamic in the paragraph that explains how FOIA came about from cross's origin to cross's adaptation to overcome evil. Now, before the FOIA, before the federal FOIA, a concern test, I'm starting to narrow, by the way, because I'm getting to where what I need to be talking about from the broad history to the narrow issue, a proper and direct concern test had rationalized, had rationalized, so I like that verb. It's a, it's a, uh, I, I said before the federal, which is why I'm now using a past perfect tense, a past participle here, um, but, had rationalized denial, FOIA superseded. So I'm telling a story again. The past 
it had rationalized. Now FOIA comes on the scene and supersedes a house report reasons no employee believes. And so I'm explaining this FOIA supersede, superseding. Again, an arc that goes from before the FOIA. I'm hoping it's going to come up to the present. Request for neutrality and exemptions replaced. Right, so I'm telling a story about from before until and how we got to where we are. Um, so that's what we want to do. I want to make sure these subject verb choices are effective at the sentence level. Do they describe what's going on in the sentence? Does the main verb control that sentence the way a thesis sentence controls a paragraph? And does it also fit into the story we're telling? Does it fit into the structure above it? Now we're at the sentence level, you see, and we're looking above and below. We're looking outside from the sentence, and then we're looking within the sentence to make sure it fits together. Let's look at something else. This is a paper uh, draft. I have to emphasize a draft from a student paper some years ago about a Twitter defamation case. Um, th this was only a draft. The student can go on and write a great paper. Um, the point at this draft stage was not even the analysis. It was mostly about uh, a dialogue about the background. So I want to be clear that um, if, we, if we pick at this a little bit, uh, this was an early draft just to get words on paper. But that gives us an opportunity to look at something maybe not fully formed. Uh, in this Twitter defamation case, we're coming to analysis, right? So we already have background up to this point. Let's see uh, what kind of job the author does with subject and verb choice. So to determine whether Spooner will prevail in the action against the AP, the court must first determine, must first determine whether he is a public figure. In his complaint, Spooner asserts he performs his officiating duties. Uh, he, semicolon, so I've got an independent clause. He does not grant. He eschews. He does not participate. Based on these assertions, it appears Spooner believes he is a public figure. And therefore, I've got a, a conjunction, so I'm looking at an independent clause. He should not have to meet. He should not have to meet. All right, let's go a little bit uh, farther down here. Drag us down just a bit. Despite Spooner's belief regarding his status as a figure, defendants can make a reasonable argument as courts grappled to distinguish. Uh, that's actually, I got, got caught on that. That's a subordinate clause, but obviously a pretty significant one coming before the uh, full line before the sentence. So I'll keep it, keep it marked. Uh, plaintiffs continued. And let's go down a little bit more. One such plaintiff was, okay, and this is a subordinate clause, but it's a long one. So let me say he who filed, and then court considered, judge noted, we've got a long uh, quotation here. I'm going to skip that. The judge further stated, all right, I'm going to stop there. Let's go back up and see what we're doing. Um, so my subjects and verbs, court must first determine, court must determine, court determines, right? That's, that's not the strongest start, but if that's, again, if that's sort of definitionally where I've got to start my analysis, and I like the adverb first, Although I will tell you, we want to try to keep verb phrases together. So let's move that adverb outside the verb phrase, unless it has to be in there for clarity. So the court must determine first whether he is a public figure, or you can put it before, the court first must determine whether he is a public figure. And now it's more effective when we keep our verb phrases together. Court determine, Spooner asserts, he does not grant, he eschews, and he does not participate. It appears he should not have to meet. 
Now that tells a nice story. Uh, court must determine. So this paragraph is going to be about what the court must determine. Now we're going, how is the court going to do that? Well, on evidence. And now we have a series of clauses that tell us what that evidence is. Springer's asserting, granting, eschewing, participating. And finally, the conclusion the court might reach, he should not have to meet as a result. Um, I'm not wild about this one, it appears. So I've got to, I, I want to drill down on that. That's a linking verb, uh, just like uh, to be, to appear, um, because it's not used here in the sense of a magician who appears on stage, uh, but it's used here in the sense of stating an equation, an inequality or description. It appears, Spooner believes, and we really should have a, have a that right there. It appears that Spooner believes he is a public figure for clarity. Um, and so the question is, can I defend it as the writer? Do I want to say, is it important to me to subordinate what's really going on in the sentence? Because Spooner believes he is a public figure, right? That's what's really going on in the sentence. Um, can I defend this clause? How else could I say it? Um, based on these assertions, uh, do I need the clause at all? Spooner believes he is a public figure. That might work by itself. Uh, Spooner concluded, comma, based on these assertions, comma, that he was a public figure or a private figure. Um, that would work too. You know, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think what we have here, and we gotta be really careful to ferret these out, is we have a B verb or passive structure, a linking verb that is subordinating the main subject, which should be the main subject and main verb of this sentence. And so can we get rid of them? Or can we restate this sentence uh, so that the important thing is the main subject and verb? Because that's where we want our readers focus. And I think we can. So we can uh, improve this paragraph, although it's a really good paragraph, we can improve it even more. Uh, let's go look at the next one. Despite Spooner's belief regarding his status, the defendants can make a reasonable argument. All right, let's go through and just look at these subject verbs. Defendant can make, courts grappled, plaintiffs continued. One plaintiff was, who filed. The trial court considered, judge noted, judge further stated. Okay, we, we'll stop there, we'll pretend that's the end. Well, I'll tell you what, temptation's got me, I wanna see what happens. Judge clearly found, Okay, so one more down there, good. What I like about that last one down at the end is it finishes our arc, right? Defendants can make an argument. What happens to that argument? Well, a judge ultimately is gonna rule on it. And that's the progression of this paragraph from point A to point B. Let me slide down again one more time, I wanna see. Um, okay, the next thing the writer is gonna do is put together the, the facts and the rule to an application, which is great. This is an analysis section. That's exactly what our writer should be doing. All right, so let's go back up. Um, defendants can make. Is this paragraph then going to be about defendants making their argument? That is, this paragraph is about the defendants, the defense argument, and I think it is. Um, this paragraph is gonna tell the story of that argument when it comes before the court. Courts grappled, courts grappled with this issue, right? So that makes sense and I love that verb, right? What a great colorful uh, diction there to use a word like grappled to explain how courts were inconsistent and, and had trouble making that, those calls. Uh, plaintiffs continued, you know, maybe we could even use, I like that, it's good, right? But maybe we could even use a word like, when we ask is continued a strong verb, right? It definitely communicates something. It's not a B verb. I like that. So courts grappled, but you know, plaintiffs didn't give up. What did they do? They continued. Ah, could we do better than continue? How about persistent? Plaintiffs persisted. Like that's a, that tells us more colorfully what's going on. But hey, it's, it's better, better than a linking verb. So good. Plaintiffs continued. Now nah, this is, this I want to examine closely because what do we have here? We have the verb to be in its past tense was the verb to be. One plaintiff was. The literal, the, the, the true subject and verb of this, main, of this sentence, the main subject and verb, one was. Wow, that's a dry sentence, isn't it? 
is that sentence doing anything? Is it communicating anything to the reader? One was, plaintiffs continued, plaintiffs persisted. We've got something going here. Courts grappled, plaintiffs continued. One was, ah, that's terrible. I don't like it. I don't like it. What if we had said instead, who's the, who's the actor in this sentence? Let's go back, right? We want to talk about the main subject and the main verb. So instead of looking at what the words say, let's ask who the actual main subject is. And what is that subject doing? What is the action? Well, let's read it. This one plaintiff was Michael Gomez, who filed a defamation suit against a newspaper writer who charged the jockey with deliberately trying to keep his horse from making its best efforts. All right. Michael Gomez is the actor. He's suing for defamation against a newspaper writer. Let's tell that story. Right? I want Michael Gomez to be my subject. I want lawsuits to be involved with my main verb. So maybe I just say something like, in one case, a little prepositional phrase to show that now I'm drilling down. Right? I went from defamation suits, plural, and now I'm going to drill down to one. In one case, comma, Michael Gomez sued a newspaper reporter who charged Gomez, comma, a jockey, comma, with trying to hold back his horse. I like that a lot better, don't you? Main subject, main verb, Gomez sued. That's better, right? Courts grappled, plaintiffs persisted. Gomez sued. All right, let's go on. Trial court considered. Eh, it's not the strongest, but I get it. That's what courts do, right? It's not the, it's not the most entertaining job in the world. Uh, people sue, courts consider. Um, I don't like the verb, I'll tell you my problem with the verb consider, aside from it being a little weak, is it's not really supposed to be a, a transitive verb used in this way. Court didn't consider Gomez. The court considers an issue. It doesn't consider a person. So the trial court regarded, or the trial court classified, or the trial court opined or determined, or maybe the trial court analyzed and determined, or why don't we, we could, I don't think there's anything wrong with that to be clear, but if you really want to get into main subject and main verb, what's this about? It's, it's really still about Gomez and he was a limited public figure. I know I'm opting for a beaver when I say that, but isn't the definition of Gomez the very nature, the very heart of this sentence? Gomez was a limited public figure, comma, the trial court concluded. Right? And, and even then, uh, the trial court concluded is the, actually the main subject, main verb of the sentence, but it's starting with that strong independent clause, the equality relationship between Gomez and public figure. That's what this sentence is about. Let's make it come first. Next sentence, judge noted. I hope you'll have a chance to review my technical tips uh, for legal writers, which is a document circulated with these videos. Um, in that document, I talk about being really careful with this word noted. You know, if a judge notes something, and it's not important, because you know where notes go, they go in footnotes. So let's not use it for things that are important. This was in support of the holding. And so I don't think noted is the right verb. Uh, and it's weak, right? It's a main verb in this sentence. It's not saying much. So the other nitpick here in support of its finding um, the determination that Gomez is a limited public figure is actually a question of law, and courts find facts, but they hold law, they rule law, they determine law. Um, the trial court, uh, you have a little bit of latitude when you talk about applying the law to facts, and admittedly, I, I think it's an arguable case here. Um, and the distinction I'm urging you to draw is not hard and fast, to be clear. It's just, it's partly a preference of mine. but. Uh, I don't like the word finding here. Um, I, and, and I'm not wild about noted as the main verb. So let's think about what's going on in this sentence. We've got a long quote that the writer feels is important to use. There's no way in the world that a man could decide to become a jockey, put on the silks, and ride before hundreds of thousands and not call himself a public figure. I love the quote. I think the writer is justified in wanting to use a direct quote. That's terrific. Um, one thing I'll say, Look how it's introduced. It's not introduced properly. We either need noted, comma, uh, quote mark, bracketed, 
uh, capital T uh, close bracket. So we've got a comma introducing an independent clause or noted that. Let's put the word that in and then we make the quote a subordinate clause. Either way is fine, but this is uh, trying to get the best of both worlds and it gets the worst of both. Um, in any event, what's going on? This fantastic quote is what's going on. Maybe first off, what did, the, what did the court do? I get that the court is probably going to be our main subject because the court speaking this quote, that's what's going on here. Okay, the judge or the court, I don't think we need both, the court or the judge. What is happening? How about a word like reasoned? Isn't that how the judge got from point A to point B? The judge reasoned or the court reasoned. And then, you know what, another way to introduce a direct, uh, a, in, a direct quote and independent clause, a colon. How about just that? Let's not make much of the judge. Let's focus on what matters. The judge reasoned, colon, or the court reasoned, colon, bracketed capital T, there is no way in the world, and so on. I like that. That's stronger. And that way we see what's happening, right? Gomez was a limited figure. Court reasoned. We're providing the reason that Gomez was a limited figure. So yes, we stated an equality. Now we're explaining it with reasoning. So our, our readers is reading a story through these subjects and verbs. The judge further stated, ah, yeah, it's so weak, it's so weak. It's not bad, it's okay. I mean, for one thing, we really should be saying the court. The emphasis is just, uh, and that's just sort of an, an inside baseball usage preference. But we should be saying the court stated. In any event, the court stated further or further stated the plaintiff voluntarily made himself publicly seen. Um, it's all right. I'm going to let it go. Uh, it's not the strongest thing. Um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes there you just do have to get it out. You just got to have multiple quotes. We have to attribute them and we can't put them back to back. So you need some little transition in there. The court further stated. Um, Let's go down just to the very end here. The judge clearly found, again, let's say the court clearly found, I don't like the word found again, the court, and let's watch these adverbs. Clearly, does that tell us something if it were not there? The judge found, the judge ruled, the judge ruled Gomez to be a public figure for a limited range of issues relating to his professional capacity. By the way, going back up, that's a good sentence in that look how it nicely brings the arc together. I like that. We started with despite Spooner's belief, and we end on the court firmly ruled otherwise, right? So despite the belief, opposite conclusion. That's a nice arc for the paragraph. So I like the progression. I like where the sentence ends up. Uh, but this clearly word, that's not doing anything for me. Is If we need to characterize it, then we haven't told the story. You know, in journalism, the saying is, show me, don't tell me. Show me, don't tell me. So uh, if you've shown me, then you don't need to say it clearly. If you feel like this word is necessary, let's go back and make sure you showed me. All right. The judge ruled public figure for limited range of issues relating to his capacity as a, as a jockey. Alternatively, again, we could restate the equality. Thus, Gomez was a public figure, at least for his capacity as a professional jockey, or at least for purposes of being a jockey, something like that. Um, I, would, I would like to not have every sentence of the last three start with the court and then subordinate the action. It'd be nice to mix it up a little bit. Um, but that's, a, that's a, not a bad paragraph. So I, I hope this gives you some idea of what you can be doing at the sentence level. I want to take you before we wrap up to one last piece. Since this just popped into the public domain, I want to show you that you, know, you can really take an exercise like this and work on anything. When you look at subjects and verbs, you can really get a feel for uh, what the author is trying to convey. In legal scholarship, you know, we're usually after clarity. Uh, we're after uh, an analysis, a clear analysis, an accurate analysis. Sometimes we're after advocacy, especially when we're writing in a litigation context. Um, but writers uh, write for all different kinds of reasons. And no matter what they're doing, these subjects and verbs should further that mission. They can do more than just communicate 
action, but they can set a whole tone uh, of a story and sort of uh, fill in the narrative for the reader's imagination just through the selection of main subject and main verb. So this is a uh, pages I just pulled out of uh, uh, The Great Gatsby. It recently went into the public domain, so there's all kinds of PDFs and EPUBs of it online. And this is where the narrator is filling us in a little bit on the history of Jay Gatsby, his biographical history. And I'm just gonna run through and mark some uh, subjects and verbs. Uh, an instinct toward his future glory led him, instinct led. Uh, uh, he stayed dismayed at ferocious, da, da, da. then he drifted and he uh, was still searching. Uh, Cody, a different uh, related fellow, was uh, transactions made him um, ramifications played. Um, he had been coasting, all right, uh, yacht represented, I suppose Cody asked, he was employed, arrangement lasted, it might have lasted, I remember, it was, women used to rub champagne, it was, he didn't, he never understood, he was, all right. Um, what's being told here, this history of Jay Gatsby? Instinct led, he stayed, he drifted, he was still searching. See that story, isn't that remarkable? I mean, this is the story of Jay Gatsby's early life in subjects and verbs. Everything else is just dressing to make it, to make, to fill out that picture, to make it even more precise and vivid. But the, the main verb and main subject, they tell the story. Instinct led, he stayed, he drifted, he was still searching. Cody, a different fellow, Cody was, transactions made him, ramifications played, he had been coasting. And he's going to meet Gatsby. Right, these two forces are coming together, Gatsby and Cody. And we have Cody's life story in subjects and verbs. He was, that's what this paragraph is about, what Cody was before Gatsby. Transactions made him, ramifications played in his life. He coasted and met Gatsby. For young Gatsby, yacht represented. I suppose he smiled, Cody asked, this is the encounter of the two men. He was employed. This is now as they have, a, have this relationship together. He was employed. Arrangement lasted. It might have lasted. Right? So now we're being told a story, a factual narrative, and a counterfactual narrative, which begs the question, what happened? Cody died. I remember. Now you see how the author turns us back in time. Now it's becoming wistful. We're, we're in the author's present perspective, now looking back through a haze of recollection. I remember, it was. Women used to rub champagne. And we talk about vivid uh, detail to enhance our recollection. It was, he didn't, he never, he was. Right, this wistful recollection. Notice here, now if this was legal writing, I'd say, oh my gosh, be verb, be verb, uh, uh, a linking verb, a be verb, right? Even this used to is a subordinating, uninformative verb. But you know what? That's what the writer wants. This is hazy recollection. This is, uh, yeah, there's, there's champagne being rubbed, but by whom into what and why? I don't remember. Um, this is all fuzzy. And that's exactly what the writer wants. These last paragraphs are wistful recollection of remembrance, ending this story, 
and bringing us up to when? Now, he told me all this very much later, speaking from today. And what a, what a beautiful pacing, right? As you can almost see the legal scholarship background, background. They come together, the application. You know, we don't really do wistful recollection in legal scholarship, but what a beautiful narrative ending. And I, I really just pulled this page. I just scanned Great Gatsby page after page until I found something with a lot of text because there's, there's a lot of dialogue in the book. And this gets, this doesn't work as well with direct quotations and dialogue, which has a different rhythm. But this was the uh, first page I, I came across that had a bunch of text going on. And look at that, main subjects and verbs telling a story. So uh, telling a story, I should say, that it fits with what the author is trying to achieve. And that's what you want to do. You want to do that in your legal scholarship. Your purpose is different. Your purpose is different. And you want to know your purpose. And you want to state that up front. That's part of your introduction. When you go achieve that purpose, you want to use narrative uh, to tell a coherent story. Keep your reader engaged. Keep the reader moving along. And, and give the reader a feeling that uh, uh, it's, he or she is really taking, taking into account something special. I hope this has been helpful for you, taking a look at your work at these different levels of abstraction. Um, there are countless more exercises you can do, uh, but I'm sure you've seen enough of me uh, for now. So I'll sign off and wish you happy writing.